Welcome to the Donahue Group. We're delighted that you can join us for another wonderful uh, half hour of conversation with Chief Justice Shirley Abramson, who is our uh, guest this month. Also joining me, Cal Potter, former state senator and superintendent of library services for DPI. Ken Risto, a jack of all trades in the Sheboygan Area School District. A simple uh, social studies teacher. A simple social studies teacher. I'm Mary Lynn Donahue. I practice law here in Sheboygan. I've been back in town for quite a while. Our guest uh, again is Chief Justice Shirley Abrahamson, uh, and we had a wonderful half hour uh, uh, talking about the court system, uh, both in uh, Wisconsin and in the federal court system. Uh, the chief has been uh, Chief Justice for 10 years, has been on the Wisconsin Supreme Court for 30 years, and we were talking about you've marked the 50 year uh, graduation from law school, and, uh, and, uh, and it seems like yesterday. There you go. And, uh, yeah, you're really remarkable for continuing the practice and uh, of of law, and uh, you will be up for re-election um, one of these years soon. Supreme Court terms are ten years, mm -hmm. Circuit mm -hmm. Court and Court of Appeal terms are six, six years. Mm -hmm. And um, can we make an announcement? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> when, when is your term up, Chief? term is up in uh, 2009, so I would have to run in April of 2009. That's when the nonpartisan elections are uh, held, and my present intention is uh, to run, but, you know, no pressure. wait and see. Hard time pressure. <laughs> <laughs> that is a long ways off. Yeah. Well, sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. Uh, judges and justices in the state of Wisconsin are elected. That's certainly mm -hmm. not the case in, in many states. No, um, but you know most of the judges, state court judges, are elected in one form or other, whether it's retention or partisan or nonpartisan, something like over 80 percent of all the state court judges face some kind of election. And How many would be partisan? I know Illinois is a partisan some system. Some are. Yeah, I can't give you the not, exact not number. Not as many as we often think of Illinois as yeah. being the classic mm -hmm. example, I guess. But. Uh, you know, sometimes it's it's partisan, although it doesn't show that way on the ballot. The the way the you get nominated may be partisan, okay. mm -hmm. and then you run nonpartisan. But everybody knows because of the way you're nominated. Okay. So it just as many states as there are, as many varieties mm -hmm. of way to select judges. And I think um, the um, uh, a lot of people do not realize that a nonpartisan election means that you don't run as a, a mm -hmm. on the basis of a political party you just run as a as a person right. and um, uh, city and county positions school board positions right. are all nonpartisan races and those are the the spring elections as we mm -hmm. call it I, I call it dead of winter elections <laughs> uh, and uh, the federal system is to the best of my knowledge completely appointed mm -hmm. the district court the, uh, the Courts of Appeal and then the, the, uh, the uh, U.S. Supreme Court. Do you have an opinion as to which system is better? Both systems have its pl their pluses and their minuses, and it's up to the jurisdiction to choose. Now, in 1846, when we had our first state constitutional event, uh, convention, that was pre-state convention, there was a long, hard debate in Wisconsin whether to choose by appointment or by popular election. And it was the same arguments that are made today were made then. It really hasn't changed much. And it was decided in Wisconsin that judges should be elected by the people. But the decision was also made, and it's quite clear in the debates, that the judges are responsible not to a political party, they're not responsible or answerable as such to the legislature or the executive. The judges are responsible and accountable for adhering to the law and interpreting the law and guaranteeing the people the rights and responsibilities under the state law and under federal law. So election does not mean that, unlike partisan political uh, people like the executive or legislators doesn't mean you're answerable in that sense of putting your finger up to the wind and saying how what do the people want mm -hmm. because the judiciary says what does the Constitution want 
What does the state statute want? And there are criteria as to who can run. A That's person right. can't just gradu graduate from law school and decide to run for the Supreme That's Court. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. You need to be uh, at least have five years under your belt as a uh, licensed mm -hmm. lawyer. The, um, the, the process of appointing judges, of course, is always in the limelight when the um, confirmation hearings are, mm -hmm. are on television. And uh, uh, I think among us we can agree that those, uh, the Alito hearings, for example, may not have been particularly edifying, may not have been all that informative, and certainly had a partisan cast to them. But coming back to Wisconsin, where we elect our judges, um, we often talk on this show about how the political landscape has changed since Cal was in the in the state senate, uh, from when you started to when you left, and more how more money, special interest groups, mm -hmm. PACs, yeah. mm -hmm. and uh, we kind of uh, cry out for legislative or election kinds of reform and, and so forth. Um, from time to time, many judges run unopposed. Mm -hmm. um, Supreme, most do. Most do, particularly at the circuit court level and the court of appeals. Supreme Court justices uh, often have uh, challenges, and I guess because it is more um, those cases really, when they finally get up to the Supreme Court, they tend to have more import. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some nasty elections mm -hmm. um, where lots and lots of money has gotten spent, uh, and uh, it seems that the dignity of talking about your qualifications for judge and so forth seem to be damaged. Um, what are your thoughts? Uh, it, judges also need to be very careful. They cannot go out and raise money themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but That's good. It's very good, but they need to have people who can go out and raise money mm -hmm. for them. And uh, it, it's, it's, it seems tricky. Are you in favor of public financing of elections? Is there a better way that we could be doing things? We do seem to struggle along and mm -hmm. people get elected and the, the system stands. but. I favor elections in Wisconsin. We have a very educated population. They are accustomed to voting for uh, judges. Uh, I think if you took polls, much more than 50% would favor retaining elections. On the other hand, we have several problems. One, apathy. Many times, less than 25% of the people vote in judicial elections in the spring. So we have to get more people interested in judicial elections and voting. Second problem we have is the issue of what can judges say. What we don't want is judges making promises as to how they shall rule on a case. That is a no-no. We want judges who are, regardless of their personal opinions on issues, are going to administer the law and interpret and apply the law in a neutral, impartial fashion. So we have to be careful about trying to force judges into making promises about how they're going to rule. That's not fair. Judge shouldn't do that. And the third problem we have is money. Campaigns cost money, mostly for um, media, TV, radio, newspaper ads. Judges in this state cannot personally raise money, and that's good. You don't want a judge putting the heat on people <laughs> and saying, well, you know, give me money, and then the people say, well, we have to give the judge money because who knows what the judge will do if we don't. That's not good. We don't want that. So I do favor public financing for judicial races. But of course, I don't have the power to do that. That is a legislative power. And we do have public financing for Supreme Court races in Wisconsin, but it's a very limited amount. Mm -hmm. And um, in recent elections, the, you'd get $35,000 from the state which is not very much. Not many television ads, no. though. No. Or radio, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. So it's very hard to do. Now, I have taken public financing in each of my campaigns and have abided uh, by uh, the rules. But as to public financing, the devil is in the details of uh, mm -hmm. how you uh, administer it and how you set it up. And the legislature has worked on this, but has it managed to bring forth a, uh, a bill 
Well, and they've been brought for bills. They haven't enacted them. Yet. Yeah, and, and we've talked about the the seeming paralysis in our state legislature about campaign finance reform and all sorts of things. But that's another that's another episode. Another program, <laughs> yes. Do you have some thoughts about those first two problems? Because it seems to me that those two are, at least in my mind, intertwined. Mm -hmm, I mean, mm -hmm. what gets lots of people out to vote is talking about these kinds of issues and having knockdown, drag out diff policy differences. And on the one hand, you clearly, and mm -hmm. I couldn't agree with you more, you don't want judges saying, well, you, if you vote for me, mm -hmm. you could, I'm gonna rule on this mm -hmm. case, this case, this case, in this mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. How do you engage people into wanting to get out and vote when you really can't talk about policy mm -hmm. issues? What is it you could talk about that would right. get people there? And most of the issues that special interest groups want to talk about are hot button issues that don't come to the court. Right. Mm. You know, it's not, they're not going to come. They're legislative. If they come, we're governed by a federal case. So it's uh, really uh, not very significant, but you do get a lot of that. I think on uh, the apathy issue in many states, uh, a neutral group like the League of Women Voters or some other group put out pamphlets, and you do get that in Wisconsin too, uh, that talk about the judges and talk about uh, uh, criteria and guidelines and qualifications. So that's one thing. This program is an attempt also, as I see it, uh, to interest people in the court system. Uh, all of our outreach programs are attempts to interest people in the court system, tell them what we're doing and how it affects them. Uh, so those are, are techniques to be used and to remind everybody what they learn in civics about the court being neutral, impartial, nonpartisan, no agenda, no ideology. Typically, what types of people donate to judicial groups? I mean, is it all simply, I mean, obviously the lawyers and the various bar associations, you know, we have a governorship, you know, that the, was, WIAC is going to be involved in the Wisconsin Association of Manufacturers. And a lot depends on the individual okay. judge and where the judge uh, has come from, maybe the city or community, uh, maybe the judge's background. Now, in my races, uh, and I don't know this last one in 99, but in prior races, when I looked back, I found that uh, the contributions might have been almost 50-50 of lawyers and non-lawyers. Mm -hmm. uh, large, I've tried to get large numbers of people. When I say I have tried, I've asked the committee to try and get large numbers with small contributions, $5, get people interested in the race. Mm -hmm. It's hard on the bookkeeping, <laughs> but it's very, I think, very important. So I think in one of my races, I had something like 5,000 contributors, which for a state court race is very high. But that, I think, is very important. Mm -hmm. The courts don't belong to judges. The courts don't belong to lawyers. The court belongs to all the people, whether you're there or not. And I think that's why uh, public financing is good, and I think that is the message. And it has to be a message that's repeated. I know you who teach social science, social studies, uh, must be able to say that you might spend, out of 15 weeks, one week on the court system. Mm -hmm. It's right? about right, yep. Yeah. One week. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to expect the students to remember that. And maybe in college, it's going to be the same thing. Maybe they'll take a course somewhat mm -hmm. on the judiciary. If not, it's going to be sandwiched in. And so we need to do more in the school system. Because law is a way of teaching reading and writing and analysis. And cases are fun because yeah. they tell stories about human beings they really do. who have trouble. I mean, this is drama. Right. This is drama. And you mentioned uh, we have teaching institutes for teachers. We, throw, we put that on once a year with the state bar to teach the teachers how to teach about law. We have case of the month. We pick, public information officer picks a case. That would be of interest. Students can study up on that case. They can then read the, res they can listen to the oral argument on their computers. Mm -hmm. 
through the website? Yeah, well, I think in the classroom was one of the things I've been most feeling very good about in my classroom was kids looking at various you know, national constitutional mm -hmm. uh, questions that are sure. facing the court and letting them do some research and letting them see, now how would you decide this mm -hmm. case and why would you decide this case and then watching the dialogue back mm -hmm. and forth. Mm -hmm. A lot of popularity of mock trial mm -hmm. uh, here right. in Sheboygan mm -hmm. at the high school level. There's uh, four, four high schools in the local county or five or six and mm -hmm. in February it's always fun to go down to the county courthouse and watch the cases. Sure, and this is, what is this? It's a technique for a dramatic incident, the case, where the students learn to read, write, debate, analyze, mm -hmm. three branches of government, mm -hmm. and life. And when I'm a judge at the mock trial uh, uh, sessions, I think some of these kids are better than, <laughs> than we are, <laughs> really are very good. in you terms know, of their performance and their mastery of evidence. Well, and the winners, uh, the two top teams, mm -hmm come and argue before the Wisconsin Supreme Court in, uh, right. I think it's in March. Mm -hmm. And the whole, usually the whole court sits and devotes an afternoon to this. And the kids are amazing. They're very good. They're mm -hmm. very good. Yeah, we were well, very fortunate. Sheboygan South had a couple of chances, the opportunity yeah. to argue in front mm -hmm. of you. And mm -hmm. they were very, very impressed with how attentive you were. Sure. I think one time, I think they were a little, uh, Surprised when I think one of the justices just got up and left the room for a moment for whatever reason that happens, oh. and I think they were, they were just a little taken aback by that. And I said, you have to understand that in in this kind of a situation, that you have to get used to that. It's fun. Well, that happens even in oral argument. Exactly. It could be any number of things. It could be that you could uh, just sit so long. You could sit so long. <laughs> Human nature requires right. that you leave. Uh, there's an emergency telephone call. Sure. Uh, so they usually come right back, and you can hear the oral argument in the in the chambers if you want to, uh, because uh, there's a system in the Capitol for doing that, as well as the computers are usually on listening, so the judicial assistants might be listening, et cetera. So they don't really miss very much. If I could double back just for a second. I was sure. struck by something you said, uh, Chief, that you said when we were talking about contributions, you. Uh, you said, in looking back, I found, am I hearing you say that during a campaign when you're running and people are giving you money somewhere, there must be a firewall, obviously, of some kind or another, if I can call it that, you don't really know until after the election? You don't make it a practice of knowing those kinds of things? Money generally comes into the treasurer of the campaign right. who uh, documents it and then makes deposits. It's generally checks. Very rarely do you have cash. And then I will send a thank you note to everybody. And at the bottom of the thank you note, it says, if you have been a recent litigant, or <laughs> you are presently a litigant, or in the near future you expect to be a litigant, please advise us so we can return the money. <laughs> oh, is that right? Okay. okay. I do that. That's right. a matter of good my idea. practice. Right. It is a good idea. Uh, and then if after the election comes, uh, I t sort of do a check for cases for a while to make sure mm -hmm. whether somebody would have given me funds and not have realized it because a lot of times you might have, say in teachers, there'll be five teachers that will represent many and they don't view it as their case, for example. Exactly. But anyhow, uh, that's what uh, we do. And so I am, it's all open public record and it's now I think on the website as to contribution so there's no excuse for me not to know but I can't remember 5,000 people <laughs> right I, I'd like to uh, talking about double back um, I am intrigued by the um, it's just not a very edifying process to the, the, the federal confirmation hearings for the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. And I think since Justice or Judge Bork's mm -hmm. um, uh, nom ex mm -hmm. nomination process, uh, it is really blood sport. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, it does not, and, and, and the justices that we get are delightfully in some respects unpredictable uh, so that you may confirm Justice Souter thinking that he wears black and in fact he wears white or red or blue or, or, or whatever. Um, 
how does the <laughs> how do we get good justices when it is such a political process uh, at the federal level and even for district court judges and and court of appeals judges um, the litmus test that we talk about seems to be there um, and and judges who or uh, people who have they just seem to just talk around themselves, and it's not their fault. It's the these really kind of silly questions from the legislators. Um, who are motivated by political agendas, and here's someone who's grimly so, so right? grimly so. Yeah. I, it's just a, it it it's it's an ugly process. Can we do it a better way? Is the well, I think that um, if you look, you always have to look at history. Uh, this is not the first time in history where we've had that. Many people who turned out to be great justices uh, got a lot of heat in the confirmation. Justice Louis Brandeis was one, for example. Uh, and over the history uh, in the, I think it was the 19th century, let's not get my centuries confused, many people went down to defeat in the Senate. And in more recent years, very few have gone down to defeat. Uh, Nixon had some trouble on several uh, nominees, and looking back on it, some of them rightly so, and others got caught in uh, this uh, partisan uh, bickering, and we lost some good judges uh, in that. But as a whole, I think that uh, we've got a very good federal judiciary, and I think we have an excellent state court a judiciary elected, and uh, we just have to keep trying. But over the history, we're just going to have differences of opinion. And I think in a democratic society, you wear them, whether it's nominations or whether it's uh, in an elective system. So although we make mistakes, I think as a whole, the Wisconsin electorate has done a terrific job and I think that uh, we've gotten some very good people. And but I you have to have an awful lot of internal fortitude <laughs> <laughs> to either face uh, the uh, Senate or face the electorate. Mm -hmm. But I think that elections in Wisconsin are very healthy, or can be very healthy. They're an opportunity to go out and talk to the people and listen. Because mm -hmm. I think judges should be doing that all the time. But an election is a good event, too. One of the, Go ahead, Kyle. I was just going to say, you know, we were looking at some of the problems. And one of the things that I see on the modern scene is, is we're seeing um, an analysis of the role of the court that some, in my opinion, maybe my opinion, just it's true, is, is a, a wrongly concluded that the courts have gotten into lawmaking. And it's not their business. That it's the legislature that makes the laws. And I was contend that the lawmaking is, you're an, an, analyzing based on constitutional individual mm -hmm. rights, the practices, policies, and laws of the state of Wisconsin, and that is your job. That's right. And sometimes maybe some lawmakers may not agree with your decision, but it's not because it's, you're overstepping your bounds, it's, they just uh, disagree. I think you've stated it perfectly. I think the court does what it's there to do look at the statutes, apply them in the situation, decide if it's unconstitutional, if we have to do that, and then you go on to the next case and the legislature can change the laws if the legislature wants. That's the dialogue in a democratic society. And if you don't like the case, say that. I think it's wrong because. Mm -hmm. Court might have done something else. Perfectly good. First Amendment, free press, free speech, right. Uh, but to make personal attacks or to slur the institution yes. as being out of step or not doing it properly or the, the current phrase is activist court. Mm -hmm. No one knows what that means. Polls show people don't know what it means, but you and I know what it means. It means I don't like the decision. decision. <laughs> yes. It's very simple, That's right? right? That's very right. simple. And it's okay to say that. But that's what you should say. Should say, right. That's right. No. But, if you, but you will have people saying that the, the courts can't make the law. Well, there is the common law. There is a, you know, a lack of understanding of where laws come from. They come from statutes, but they come from 
judges making law because that's what their job is. Yeah, and it's a different kind of law than the legislature makes. Exactly. And I think courts fully understand that the public policy of the state is in the legislature. Our job is, if it comes to the court, to apply it in that particular case, what if we have to, say whether it's constitutional or not. And that's what we do. And uh, we, But we don't make the public policy of the state. If you don't like our interpretation or our constitutional view, we're just doing the job. Legislature can change all of that. Sure. Want a constitutional amendment? Do it. Like in the veto, they did that. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. And I think it's been pretty good in Wisconsin about not slurring the institution. Mm -hmm. For the most part, I think people have been very responsible in saying, I don't like the decision. Mm -hmm. We think you erred. We're going to change it rather than and, and, personal attacks. And what's kind of sad is sometimes what happens in another state today is a wave that some people try to ride. I, I, I don't want to get into specifics, but there's a constitutional amendment coming up this fall that people use the experience in Massachusetts to say, well, we need a constitutional amendment in Wisconsin because we don't want to have the activist judges or courts that they have over here. And it, this international or national coverage of court cases mm -hmm. today has sometimes brought agendas that uh, get into, again, uh, mis misaligning what the courts really are supposed to be doing. That's true, because we are a nation, and the media is national, yeah. and indeed we're global. Yeah. So what happens anywhere in the world has an effect on all of us. Yeah. I think that's very true. Yeah. Um, I think that uh, uh, in some respects, the law lawyers Judges come out much better than lawyers do. Um, but I think there's misrepresentation or misunderstanding of what the legal system is supposed to do. And, you know, I, I do personal injury work, so I, I, I am opposed to what's called tort reform because I think, our, as you say, that our judicial system really is meets and addresses the needs of litigants who, who have complex issues that have to be resolved. and. Uh, the explosion of litigation and I, a so happy society is another one of the stereotypes we have. And and I just think that those things aren't true. We yeah. have a, a well ordered system, both at the state and the federal level, that that address our needs. We could have more judges. We could have more lawyers. There could be more resources put into the system. But uh, but I do think overall it it functions well. Mm -hmm. Studies by the University of Wisconsin, which is a leader in these studies, show that if you figure out the population and uh, the commerce, we have less litigation now than we had in the 19th mm -hmm. century. Uh, the people are not as litigious as they were. And if you look back at some of the 19th century cases, they were fighting about $25, literally 25 bucks, uh, in the court system all the way up to the Wisconsin Supreme Court. And, and we're not a so happy country. There are many countries that have much more litigation than the United States. And although many times what look like frivolous cases are reported, what isn't reported is that they're thrown out of court. There I you mean, go. Anybody can sue anybody. I agree with that. Just put down your money and you file a paper, you are in court. But just as quickly, you're going to be out of court. And we have to, we have to stop. We could talk forever. <laughs> Chief, thank you so much for joining us. Good. We really Good. enjoyed it. Good.